Welcome everybody to the video. So what is Java's huge problem in 2023 and looking forward? Java's huge problem is that it is huge. It is bloated. It is the personification of a bloated, bureaucratic, red tape filled platform language, however we want to characterize it. Java does not make the development process quick. Initially, Java was sold as the light, nimble version of C++ or alternative to C++ would be better. And it was in a couple areas. No memory management, Java took care of that, which was an innovation of its time. Uh, Java also had very good string manipulation where C++ was not so good. In some areas, Java was light and nimble relative to its competition at the time, 95, 1995, early 96. Today, it's still nimble in those particular areas, but it's also bloated and hard to develop in, in other areas in terms of configurations. The code itself is very verbose, takes a long time to write anything relative to lighter, nimbler options like PHP, JavaScript, Python, and there are others. So its main problems, again, is that it's huge, it's large, it's slow to develop in, even though Java itself, it's a solid language. I did tons of work in Java. I started writing code in Java. I started writing Java when it first came out in late 95, early 96, something like that. I remember buying the big giant Java Unleashed book back in the day. This is before the internet became you know, video centric. And uh, so we bought books in those days. So before I get into examples of Java's bloatedness and how it got there, let me give you some bullet points that people are gonna be interested in. So number one, if you're learning Java, should you continue to learn it? Should you drop it? What's the situation there? If you're learning to code and you're learning Java, no worries, it's a good language. Everything that you learn in Java will be 100% transferable to other languages. So even if you don't end up using Java professionally, doesn't matter, it's still worth learning. I developed quite a bit, pun intended, as a developer, learning Java because Java taught me a lot about good development. It was worthwhile. I don't regret my Java days, but these days I would never start a new project in Java. No chance. So that brings me to my next point. If you're looking at Java jobs today, you're looking at working at large organizations, well, medium to large organizations. That's number one. So consider that in terms of your job opportunities. That means when you're working at a Java-based organization, chances are uh, they're going to be large, which means HR departments, which means uh, dress code, not all the time, but, you know, it would lean towards, you know, think banks, big pharma, established, well-established industries that always, already have a pretty big investment in Java, so they're not going to trash that. So that's the type of company you're going to work for, which implies... You're going to need uh, certifications, uh, degrees, much more so than if you were working for a startup or a small or medium-sized business. Keep that in mind. The other thing you have to consider is the type of development you're going to be doing, which means you're probably in the Java world, probably. There's always exceptions. Yes, there are exceptions, but probably you're going to be working on established infrastructure, meaning old legacy software, whereas big investment in Java, they will probably hire you to extend, debug older systems, which means big life cycles in terms of development. So you may find yourself at a job working on uh, an authentication system for a year or two. That's the type of work that you're going to do in Java. I'm not shaming this. I'm not putting this down on saying it's good or bad. I'm just saying this is what you have to expect. Some people thrive in that, that type of situation. Other people, not so much. Now you know. Again, there's always exceptions. There's always exceptions. There's always, you'll find small development houses that may decide to develop an Android app in Java, even though Google said a few years back, don't do any new Android work in Java. Use Kotlin instead, because Kotlin is a lighter, nimbler, much quicker to develop with language. Keep in mind, Java is powerful, like the JVM, the Java Virtual Machine, and it's a suite of tools, if you will, very powerful. And the great thing about Kotlin is that you can access that power without having to deal with the overhead of the verbose, long-winded language that Java has become. 
Another aspect of modern Java is that it's a configuration nightmare. So it's a very solid platform, but when you're uh, setting up your development environment, when you are deploying, uh, it's a lot of configuration, especially if you get into things like Tomcat and stuff. So even the lightweight framework that is popular these days, well, light, light, lightweight in the Java world is a Spring Boot. It's still heavyweight compared to the alternatives in other languages, like the JavaScript alternatives are much more lightweight, the PHP alternatives are much more lightweight, the Python Django more lightweight. What I mean by lightweight, meaning much easier to develop in, much quicker to develop in. That being said, when you have something working in Java, it's very solid. So how did Java go from being the light, nimble competitor to C++ to this uh, bureaucratic, heavyweight, slow to develop in platform? I saw it happen in real time. What happened? So when Java started gaining traction in the, uh, in the market, Java was developed by Sun Microsystems, Oracle since bought them out. So then uh, they wanted to get it into the enterprise, meaning big business, so they needed to get buy-in from different players. So they created this Java committee, if it was called, and they started putting together specifications. And that's always a disaster, right? When you have big bureaucracies involved in trying to do something new, you're going to be, uh, it's, nothing's going to happen. That's the nature of anything, any big bureaucracies, right? Whether it be software, whether it be business, whether it be government, the bigger, the less efficient it is, the less things get done, the more chance you have corruption because you got all these competing interests. Uh, there's no boss who can say, we're going this direction, forget the rest. It's just the nature of humanity. It's one of those universal principles in life in the world. Famously, for example, Steve Jobs, when he came back to Apple, he knew this from his experience working at well, owning big companies. So when he came back to Apple, he isolated his design team, John Ivey and I guess some others, from the rest of the Apple hierarchy. So they only answered to him because he knew that if they were with, if they existed, the design team, the product design team exists within the context of Apple's main infrastructure nothing was going to get done. You were going to have a Homer mobile. You were going to have monstrosities, Franken code, Frankenstein based uh, products that nobody will want. Because you can have all these people chiming, chirping in, trying to figure, get, trying to get their little uh, vision of things. That's what happened with Java. So I saw it. So they came together, this consortium companies, like I said, Microsoft, Sun Microsystems, Oracle, BEA, WebLogic, IBM, and others, all well-intentioned. But again, too many, too many cooks in the kitchen, right? And they came out with these, these, these really bad, bloated specifications. So for example, EJB1, Enterprise Java Beans version 1. Total, oh my God, what a cluster F that was. I remember... When it came out, and I bought these huge books on EJB, and I remember reading the first three chapters, like, oh, my God, this is garbage. Whoosh, throw it out. Now, of course, I was doing small app development, and EJB specification was designed for huge corporations, but it, it never worked. So shortly thereafter, they came out with EJB 2. That was crap. Finally, uh, the Java developer community, the people, who actually, the people who actually had to use these technologies started rebelling and they came up, EJB3 ended up being what the community wanted versus what this consortium of giant businesses wanted. And there was other, other big kludges and cluster bombs in uh, the Java framework, like Java server faces. Again, Java was big into abstraction. So Java server faces was, they created this layer of user interface components that was supposed to transform into everything and became just a huge mess. Java became this giant bureaucratic mess because giant bureaucratic organizations got involved in its development. That is always a recipe for disaster. Here's an important development tip for you guys. You want to keep your code base and your structures very light and nimble. The best developers write simple, easy to understand code. Why? Because code has to be updated, has to be maintained. So if you write some super complex code where the, large, where the logic is difficult to follow and the reason for the logic is not understood easily, that's terrible code. When I see somebody do that, I would say, out, no good. 
Simple code is the best code. Simple infrastructures are the best infrastructures. This is a universal in software development. I, it's a universal in combat sports. I've done tons of combat sports. I did 25 years of martial arts, tons. I used to bounce. I used to be in a bouncer in a nightclub. The super complex systems that got caught up in the minutia of things, they never produce good fighters. The best combat sports, there's complexity there, but they very they were streamlined and they have very efficient systems. Um, same thing with companies. Very streamlined, efficient companies do well. That's why you don't see innovation typically from big, huge organizations because big, huge organizations are bogged down by their bureaucracies, so there's no room for innovation, which requires free thought, right? Uh, big organizations don't like free thought, typically. So keep it light and nimble. You're going to gain from that. This is a universal principle, by the way, that applies to all aspects of life. Your body. I used to be 70 pounds heavier, and when you have 70 pounds of extra weight on you, your body, your systems have to... Your body systems have to contend with all this. The heart has to pump a lot harder and all the, the organs have to, it's much more blubber that it has to contend with and the visceral fat is throwing out chemicals. It's causing all kinds of problems for you. I can tell you, I talk about this a lot now. Lose weight. It's not fat shaming, and none of that. If you're overweight, you're less healthy, you're going to have poor mood, less energy, more aches and pains. Your body, your system is going to start breaking down over time because of all this extra. Same thing with software. You want to keep your software lean and mean. So my experience as a professional Java developer back in the uh, mid-90s to late 90s, early 2000s, I rejected the, uh, the orthodoxy put out by the Java consortium, and I just stuck to uh, very basic Java. So I did web apps, web Let's face it, for the most part, Java is all about server-side development. So I had developed my own framework, which was based on Java server pages, servlets, and uh, POJOs, plain old Java beans. I ignored a lot of the excess complexity, and that made me highly efficient. Uh, a very popular app server in the day, probably still is, I haven't looked at Java in a while, is Tomcat. Tomcat it was a nightmare to configure. So I used to use this thing called Resin, uh, Coucho Resin, which was an app server, and it made it just easy to spin up instances and uh, deploy your apps. And I had my own Java framework. I, you know, at the time, the popular framework was Struts, and uh, I think it was Struts, yeah, and there were others. But uh, the key was to use Java in an efficient way. So Java's verbosity extends beyond all the frameworks, like setting up the app servers and so on. Uh, and configuring things. The, the language itself is very long-winded. Now, I'm sure they've cleaned that up to a certain extent, but I have somebody in my mentoring group, links below, and they're developing, they have a startup, and they developed the app in Java, and he, they, he since regrets it, uh, the guy in the group. But they got it going, and, but they see how verbose it is. It just takes so much longer to get something out the door in Java uh, because the language... It's just long-winded. Like, compare it to JavaScript or PHP or Python, you can express much more functionality with much less lines of code uh, in these lighter languages. Yes, you can argue Java's got more security, you got more fine-grained control things, but a lot of times it's, uh, they're not needed. What I've presented here is what you can generally expect in Java. Yes, there are always exceptions. Yes, you find Java being utilized in specialized situations. For example, Java is famously successful with Minecraft, right? That guy developed it in Minecraft, so it worked fantastic. You see Java used here and there for small devices, I believe. Uh, Java, of course, was used quite a bit for Android development. Again, but Google, who controls Android, said go to Kotlin because it's just faster and easier. So yeah, you always find exceptions. You might find some companies who decide to use Java because they have some particular use case for it. But generally speaking, you understand how Java is used, why it's bloated, uh, it's XML configuration uh, hell. Now, I heard it's gotten lighter than it used to be, but it's, it's very different from what you see in the lighter, nimbler technologies. So that's why you see Java today generally. Generally, there's tons of Java jobs, by the way. 
Like if you're learning Java and you like Java and you worry it won't be worked, don't worry. There's plenty of work in Java. You'll never have a trouble finding a Java job uh, because of all the legacy projects. But understand what you're getting into. All right, my name is Steph. Some people call me Uncle Steph. So I mentor people in the ways of development and so much more. Check out the links below. I also have standalone courses. I have courses that teach you how your brain works based on my background in psychology, business, and martial arts. And uh, I teach people from knowing absolutely nothing about development to being professional developers. I have students who go on to work for multinationals, some of the fan companies. My superstar is actually a founder of a $1.5 billion company. So I have a good track record in terms of training people. And so if you're interested in that, you've been interested in looking at coding, you've had trouble learning it, you see the sea of, op of options and opportunities, but you're, you're having a hard time to navigate. You feel that perhaps having uh, support, live coaching sessions, you think that might be useful to you. I invite you to take a look at my boot camp. It's unique, actually. It teaches much more than code, by the way, because I realized a long time ago that to be a successful developer, there's much more to it than just learning the code. And I teach all that and so much more. All right. Thanks for watching. I hope you found this video useful. If you have any comments, you disagree with me on any aspects of what I just talked about, feel free to comment below. I've been doing this since 1994 professionally, but I don't know everything. I don't know everything. And as new facts present themselves to me, I, uh, I reserve the right to change my opinion on those new facts. We'll talk soon. Bye-bye. Thank you.